construction, I think. So if you remember, I told you that there's a, there's a technique, okay, that if you have a map which you want to study and you don't, don't have the, it doesn't have the properties that you need, sometimes you can take some subset delta and you can define a return map f equals f tau. Right, but tau is some inlet of the map. So we're going to show as an example this construction in just two specific cases. And the first one is this map f of x equals x plus x to the alpha. Okay, alpha is greater than 1. And what does this map look like? Mod 1. So, let me try to draw it well. Zero one. Okay, so as we saw, this is a full branch map. It has two branches. There's a point P, which in principle you could easily calculate, right? Which you should do as an exercise. But the exact value of P doesn't matter so much. And the derivative here is always, so F prime of X is equal to 1 plus X to the plus alpha, X to the alpha minus 1. So, in particular, at x equals 0, the derivative is 0. And everywhere the derivative is bigger than 1. So here, uh, sorry, the derivative is 1, right? So here it's tangent to the diagonal, because the derivative is 1. This tangency will play a very important role, the fact that the derivative is 1. So, because it's a fixed point and the derivative is 1, it's not uniformly expanding, it does not have boundary distortion, remember? So we cannot just apply our techniques even though it's full branch. Okay? So we're going to do this construction and then we're going to check what kind of induced map we get. So we're going to define um, delta to be equal to P1, this interval P1. And then we're going to look at the return map to delta. In other words, you take a point P, point in delta and see when it comes back to delta and look at the structure of this return map. Okay? So, the easiest way to look at it is to look first at the pre-image of delta. Because those are the points that come back immediately, right? Or at least that go into delta. Now what does the pre-image of delta look like? So here we have that the pre-image of P is a point here. Right? This is P let's call this uh, P minus 1. So you can see that this interval here, after one iteration, maps to where? Maps to delta. Maps exactly to delta, right? Because this point here maps to 1, this point here is the pre-image of P, and everything in fact, it's useful to draw again delta here, right? Just so we, we can see where delta is in the image. Right? This is delta. So you can see that this interval here maps to delta after one iteration. Okay? What about the pre-image of this interval here? Well, this interval here has a pre-image which is given exactly by this interval. Right? What is the image of this interval? 
where this point here maps to P and this point here maps to P minus 1. Right? So this is P minus 2, we can call it. And so you can see that this interval maps after one iterator to this, and therefore this interval maps after two iterators bijectively to that. Okay? And we can continue like that. So we can take, in this case, the construction is particularly easy. So here we have P minus 3. Okay? And then we look at all the P images of P, P minus 4, and so on. And we construct a sequence of intervals. Right? So this interval here will map after how many iterates. So you can see that this map, this interval here, maps bijectively to this interval here, which maps bijectively to this, which maps bijectively to this, which maps bijectively to this, which maps bijectively to this. Okay? So we have, let's see if I can get the notation right. So we have, let me call this interval I1. Um, let me go where the notation is a little bit tricky. So, okay, let me, let me look at it. So now we have all these intervals that map to delta, right? But these intervals do not belong to delta. What we want is to look at points of delta and see when they come back. Okay, now what is the image of delta? Now we look at points of delta and we look at the images, right? So what is the image of delta? Zero one. Zero one. Exactly. Okay? So this means that there is some points of delta which come back immediately to delta. Which points are those? So here is delta, right? And here is not delta. So you can see when you look at the image of delta, it maps onto 0, 1. This part here maps exactly to delta itself, bijectively. Okay? So let's call it 1. Delta 1. Okay, so let's call delta 1 is equal to the set of x in delta such that f of x belongs to delta. And what happens to this complement of delta 1? It maps to this, to 0p, which means it maps to 0p. Okay? which means that there is one part of it that maps to this interval, another part that maps to this interval, another part. So this maps bijectively to 0p, which means that we can chop this up according to the bits that land exactly here, exactly here, exactly here, in all these intervals. Okay? Which means that there is, in particular, one interval, one piece here. Let me write this underneath. Okay? Which maps, after one iteration, exactly to this. And where does this map after one more iteration? Bijectively to delta, right? So this interval here is delta 2 and is an interval that exactly maps after two iterates to delta, okay? And so on, right? So then we have here, we have delta 3, delta 4, and so on. And we can write delta n is equal to the x in delta such that f n of x belongs to that. So the union of these delta n's, what is the union of these delta n's? Is almost all of delta. The only thing that's missing is the end point here, p. Okay? Because the end point here maps to zero. Okay? And zero never comes back into delta. Okay? And in fact, neither do all these end points, right? So there is a little bit of a delicate issue with the end points. But we don't care. These endpoints are just a countable set of points that we understand very well. It's not going to make any difference in terms of the, the structure. Okay? In fact, this is a very clever way of avoiding. The whole point is that we had a problem when zero was the endpoint of one of our full one of our partition elements, right? When we were looking at this at a full branch map, 
Remember, one of the problems was that we, when we refine the partition, we always had zero on the boundary of one of the elements of the partition, and this was what was creating the boundary distortion. Okay? Here, we have created a different map where zero is not on the boundary of any of the elements of the partition. Okay? But the price we've paid is we've gone from two different partition elements to a countable number of partition elements. Right? And return map. So we have that for each n greater than or equal to 1, fn from delta n to 0, 1. Okay, in fact, uh, sorry, delta n to delta. So maybe I should um, modify this a little bit. Let's take the open interval p1. Okay, to be more precise, and then this is correct, and then uh, we have that Fn of delta n is a is a bijection. In fact, it's more than a bijection. Of course, it's a differentiable. It's a diffeomorphism, right? This is just a, the uh, the um, composition of of diffeomorphism. So you look at this delta one maps to delta diffeomorphically, this one maps to this interval diffeomorphically, which maps to delta 1 diffeomorphically. Okay, so in fact this is a C1, it's a diffeomorphism, C, C infinity diffeomorphism. Okay, and also the union, delta is equal to the union over all n of delta n. And also they're all disjoint. Okay. So what does the induced map look like? Okay. So in this case, we have the tau. These are the various maps. So let um, tau, tau of x equals n, if and only if x belongs to delta n. This is our return time function in some sense. Okay? Notice that this is the first return time function. We, it is not uniquely defined a return time function because if you take a point in here and it comes back, it may also come back again some other time. It may also come back some other time. So in general you have options as to which tau you choose for a given x. Okay? Here we're going to choose in general, you want to choose the most the first time you come back, if possible. I will talk about that a little bit later. And here we just choose the first time we come back, right? And then we define the induced map. Induced map f from delta to delta, right? By letting f of x equals f tau x of x. In other words, we look at this map from delta to delta and for this point here we apply once. Okay, so this delta one will map bijectively to delta. For the points in here we apply the map twice. Okay, so that means that after two times delta two will map bijectively to everything. So what does it look like, this, what does this map look like, right? So we have this, we now have delta P1, okay, this is delta to delta. What does this map look like? Well, we have this partition delta 1, delta 2, delta 3, delta 1, delta 2, delta 3, and so on. This is a countable partition that accumulates here, yeah? okay? And we want to define, we want to describe the map F. So what is the image of delta 1? The image of delta 1 is everything, right? So it goes like this. What is the image of delta 2? Right, so the image of delta 2 also maps 
monotonically and bijectively to this, which also maps monotonically and bijectively to this. So it just looks exactly the same. It looks basically exactly the same. And so on for all these intervals. Right? So delta 3 will also look like this because we take the third iterate of points in delta 3, right? So if the points belong to delta 3, then tau is equal to 3. So we define for every one of these points, we define the map f given by the third iterate of the map, and we know that the union of these points is this interval here, which maps after one iterate to this, after, so it maps diffeomorphically to this, this maps to this, and this maps to this, and maps to that. Okay, so we have Any questions about that? Is that okay? This is a, it's, it's a relatively sophisticated concept, the inducing, okay? But I think this is a great example, and I will give another one, two examples. But I think this one is important because this one is, in some sense, simplest, because you really... Uh, well, it's very explicit. Um, we have found a subset of our space, okay? And we have constructed, we have shown that if you take the first return map, this first return map has a very special structure, which is exactly the structure we've been looking at, the full branch map. Uh, now, I will leave it as an exercise for you to show that this is, so, um, we would like to show that this is uniformly expanding and has bounded distortion, mm -hmm. right? That's what we would like, because the whole point of this this, we had a map that was already full bounded, but it did not have bounded distortion. And the whole point of this is it does. Okay? So, I will leave as an exercise just the uniform expansivity, which is easy. Um, F. There's an optional exercise. Okay, in other words, this will not be included in the official syllabus of the course to show that F has bounded distortion. The uniform expansion, you can give a very simple heuristic argument. Right? Why do you think it has uniform expansion? Can you see why it should have uniform expansion? Uh, because in this part, why do you think about this? Because I'm Yeah. So, on that one, it's obvious that it's uniformly expanding because we have. Right? Why is it uniformly expanding on that term? Yeah, because also here the derivative is bigger than 1, and this maps to here where the derivative is also bigger than 1, and so it's the product of two points that are bigger than 1, right? So the only problem can come, may come if you come, when you come very close to t Because this map, this is, in this case, a uniform expansion is very easy once you see what, it's, what, what you need to do, right? Because this is almost uniformly expanding. The only problem we had was at the fixed point that is 0. Right? So what's happened when you take intervals that have very large return time? Here, what is going to be their derivative? It's big anyway, it's even bigger, right? Because you have an interval here where the derivative is bigger than 1, and then it's true that it comes here where the derivative is very close to 1, but it's still bigger than 1, right? And then it spends a long time moving back to here, and every time it's accumulating derivative uniformly. 
Okay, so you just, it's a good exercise to check that and do the calculation, but it's really very straightforward to see that it should be uniformly expanded. Uh, the, the problem that it's not defined uniquely, uh, um, and we didn't quantify it, for instance, with continuous. Excuse me? Because it's not defined uniquely. What is not defined? Because you can. I don't, I'm not sure how to explain it now. Because we are not taking the first time of arriving to, to that. In this case, we are taking the first time. Look, in this case, we are taking the first time because the points here, they move out, or in any one of these intervals, they move out, and then they move back, and then the first time they come back, that's the time we take. Okay, I only made that comment because in more general constructions, uh, often you cannot take. The, if you take the first attempt time, you don't get a very nice picture like you like here. In this particular case, it's special. You just take the first attempt time, and you get exactly the induced map that you want. Okay, so I may just made that comment. But in this particular case, it works. Yes. Any question? Okay, so that means that this function big F has a unique ergodic, absolutely continuous invariant probability measure. Okay, so when you look at the return map to here, it has an ergodic, absolutely continuous invariant probability measure. Okay, so we would like to use that to get our original goal was to study this map here. So now we have a measure for f. Can we use this to get a measure for little f, which was our map? Okay? And I will tell you how to do this, but first I want to do the construction in another example. Okay? And then we do a similar construction in a different example, just to see different cases. In both cases, we will get an induced map that has an absolutely continuous ergodic invariant measure. And then I will go back to the general theory about how you use that to get a measure for this one here. Okay. Any more questions about this? Is okay? Okay. So what's the second example in this construct where we can do this construction? So it's the map that we've already looked at before. And we say x squared minus 2. So if you remember, this is a map from minus 2, 2, minus 2, 2. And it looks like this. Okay, so this case is also full branch, does not have boundary distortion because it has zero derivative, it's not uniformly expanding because it has derivative. In this particular case, we already constructed using the conjugacy with the tenth map, as I said the other day, the map, okay, the, the measure. But that, as I said, that technique is very special. And now with this construction, we're going to be able to generalize, you know, as long as it has this picture, even if it's a little bit different like this than our construction will work. So this inducing technique is much more robust than that uh, conjugacy technique that we had there. Right? So we're going to construct an induced map. So let me choose delta, first of all. Let me just explain how we construct this induced map. So let's draw the diagonal here. Okay. And what fixed points does this map have? As you can see, it has one fixed point here. and it has another fixed point here okay but this fixed point is going to play a key role as is 
the pre-image of this fixed point. What is the other pre-image of this fixed point? This fixed point has itself as a pre-image and it has another pre-image. Can you see where that is? One. Sorry? One. No, one is just... Ah, one... It's symmetric. It's symmetric, yes. Is this point one? I'm not sure that this is one. It is one. Uh, minus one squared, minus equals one, you're right. The fixed point is exactly one, minus one. So this is minus one, wow, okay, perfect. I, I don't think I've ever kind of really registered that that's exactly the fixed point. Okay, so one is the other image of this fixed point, minus one. Okay, so minus one is a fixed point. And I'm going to choose delta to be this interval here. So I'm going to choose delta equals minus one. Now. So I choose minus one one just because minus one is a fixed point. Okay, that's the key property. It doesn't need to be. We can, as I said, the construction is very robust. As long as the picture looks more or less like this, it works. We will see later exactly what are the characteristics that we need for the construction. So what, um, what happens? How do points come back to this delta, right? So if you just look at a point, it's not clear what it does. So you take a point here, it maps to here, and then it maps to here, and then it maps to here. Okay, it's not completely where it's gone. But we can do a little bit more systematic study again. The first thing we can look at is what is the pre-image again, because it's easier to start by saying, okay, what are the points that map immediately to delta? Can you see that? What is the pre-image of minus one one? So again, let's, so we have here minus one, so it's useful to draw minus one one. So this is our delta. So now we can immediately see what the pre-images are, right? Because the pre-image will be some interval here. So this interval here, this endpoint maps to one, this endpoint maps to minus one, and it maps bijectively to minus one one. Okay? And the same thing on the other side. Very good. So we have here. We have two intervals. That map bijectively to minus one one. Now where do these intervals come from in minus one one. So we are, we, we, we are, what we want is to construct the partition of, of minus one one that come back, right? So these are the points outside minus one one that come back straight away. Are there any points inside delta that come back after one iterate to delta? That immediately, such as f of x is in delta. What's the image of delta? The image of delta, you see delta maps all underneath here. Right? So this is the image of delta here. Which lies outside delta. So in this case, no point comes back immediately after one iteration. Okay? So in this case we have delta one is empty. But, um, are there any points that come back after two iterations? In other words, are there any points that land in these two intervals, right? Because these are the intervals which after one step will fall into delta. 
okay? So where are these intervals here? Well, this interval here, uh, this interval here is this interval. And this interval here, what's the, what's the, what's the uh, pre-image of this interval here, is also the same thing, actually. Um, so, so wait, so this interval here maps. In another part. Sorry. <laughs> I also find the uh, right in a difficult. It, it, it should be another part, from one to yeah. Yes. Yeah, so no. So this interval does not no point. After one iteration, this maps to this. Okay. And there is some points that map to this interval here. So they map after two iterations. Okay. So what does this set of points look like here inside delta? In other words, what are the pre-images of this? They are two intervals. One here, I really would need some colors here, and one here. Okay, so this interval here, it maps after one iterate to this interval here, which is this interval here, which maps after one iterate to all of them. And this the same, this interval here maps after one iterate to this interval here, which is this interval here, which maps to that. Okay. So this here are delta 2. Both of these belong to delta 2. Right? So delta 2 is the union of two intervals, two extreme intervals, let's say, of delta. I'm not going to start putting no in notation because I think that makes it even more complicated. But you can, when you do it at home and you construct, you can put some notation and for all the endpoints and so on, okay? But there is a, um, there are two intervals which come back, and do they come back diffeomorphically onto delta? They come back diffeomorphically onto delta, right? Because this interval maps diffeomorphically to this interval here. Okay, in other words, this interval maps diffeomorphically to this interval here, and then this interval maps diffeomorphically to all of delta here. Okay? So both of these intervals, they map diffeomorphically. So let's actually, in this time, let's start constructing the induced map at the same time, rather than waiting to have finished the construction. So here we have our delta now, and here we have, so this is now minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, okay? And what we've done here is we've constructed two, two intervals in the extremes here. Okay, this is delta 2, this is also delta 2. So delta 2 is the union of these. And what is the image? And then we will define, again, we will define the induced map in exactly the same way, right, by this return time. So in this case, the return time will be 2, and what will the map look like here? Let's think about also the orientation, because the orientation is also not trivial here. So here, the derivative is negative, right? So now you map from here to here with negative derivative, and then from here to, to the whole thing with also negative derivative. So the composition of the two is positive. Right? So here we will have a full branch, so this will map to all of minus 1, 1, something like this, positive derivative. And what about this one, this interval here? This interval maps to this with positive derivative, right? But then this maps to everything else with negative derivative. Okay, so the composition will be negative of these two derivatives, so it will be orientation reversing, and so it will 
look something like this. It doesn't actually have those wiggles, okay? But I'm showing that this does not use exactly this explicit formula, right? So we could, we could put some wiggles here and it will give a little bit more general, but the construction will all work exactly the same. Okay, so what happens to these bits then, that do not belong to delta 2? Well, this bit maps here, okay, very close to minus 2, which means it maps here, right? That's what this region is. This is here, okay? And where does this region map to? This region maps bijectively to here, right? This region maps to this, okay, which is this. From 1 to 2. Okay, from 1 to 2. Okay, and from 1 to 2, what happens next? Well, we know that there is one interval here that then maps bijectively onto delta. <laughs> okay, so that means that there is, if you look now at this region, the problem is I need to keep changing the interval we're focusing on. So now let's So we've, we've sorted this, we're not going to worry about this anymore, okay? Now here, we look at this interval here, and this maps to 1, 2, okay? And 1, 2, we've already seen that there is an interval here that maps bijectively to delta, okay? And so we need to see which part of this interval maps to this one here, okay? So you can see here that this point will map to 1, okay, this point here will map to 2, so that means that there is an interval here, okay, that maps to this interval here, which then maps projectively to that. So this interval here takes how many interests to map projectively to delta? 2. Okay, this interval here maps once into this, and then at the next it maps bijectively to that. Okay? And this interval comes from where? In delta. So this interval here comes from one little interval here and another little interval here. So here there's a one little interval inside delta, remember this is our delta. This little interval maps to this, okay? This one maps to this because we have defined it exactly as the pre-image. Okay, so this is exactly the interval that maps. Okay, maybe you can see this interval here. Okay, it's the same, you can see it either there or there. So this little interval here, it maps up for one iterations to this, which is this, which maps to this, which then maps to that. After exactly three iterations. Okay? You start from here, one, two, three. Okay? So these are the two intervals delta three. Delta three is the union of these intervals. So we have here two intervals here, which, which is delta 3. Okay, this is delta 3, delta 3. And what is, the, what is the orientation of these branches? So you look at the derivative, simply this. Here the derivative is negative. Here the derivative is also negative. And then here the derivative is positive. Okay, so the product of all the derivatives is positive. So we get just this positive derivative, okay? And if you do the same thing here, you get again the derivative here is positive, and then the derivative is negative, the derivative is positive again, so all, all, on the whole you get negative derivative. So you get all the Then if 
you look at it carefully, you see that you can just continue in exactly the same way. Right? So here we have um, we have here. So let's just do kind of half of one extra step, and then the best thing is that just that you check on your own at home that you can see everything. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so what really the, the focus now is on this little remaining bit. This is the only remaining bit, right? Because we have that all of this bit now comes back after one iteration, right? This is the remaining bit that does not come back. And this, so, which, which corresponds to this. So we are narrowing in. We've defined delta 2, we've defined delta 3. What is left is this middle bit here. And you see that this middle bit here, around the critical point, it maps to one connected component here, very close to minus 2, right? It maps here to this little bit here, which is connected, which is this, which is exactly what maps to this, okay? So this, what we have not yet accounted for, is, is this bit which maps to this. So all we need to concentrate is what happens here now. We've basically taken care of the rest of the face space, right? And what happens here? Well, now it's easy. Now it's easy. Because now, look, now we have a very similar picture to what we had actually in the, uh, in the previous case. Because what is happening here? So on the boundary here, you have a fixed point. Okay? And here you have, therefore, uh, a partition. So here you have, what is the, if you look at the pre-image of this point, so we know that this maps by jeopardy to delta. And now, look at the pre-image of this, of this point here. It gets a bit difficult to draw here. But you get an interval here. Okay? And what is the image of this interval? Well, this point here maps exactly... Um, uh, so, wait, am I drawing the... Uh, yes. So, this point here maps to 1. This is the pre-image of 1. Right? And this here is the pre-image of this, or is the pre-image of this other endpoint. So we have that this interval maps bijectively to delta, and now we have another interval which maps bijectively to this interval. Right? Because this is the pre-image of 1, and this is the pre-image of this point. Uh, I did not draw it. Yes, this is this point here. Uh, I'm getting myself confused as well here. So this point is this point, right? And this is the pre-image. Ah, yes, because this is the map. I'm getting confused between the diagonal and the map. So this is the map, okay? And this maps to this point here. So this interval here maps bijectively to this which then maps bijectively to delta. So if you're in here, after two iterations, you will map into delta, right? But how do you get here? Well, you get here from some small interval here, which is the pre-image of this, and you get here from two small intervals here, okay, which are the intervals that map exactly to this, and so these two points we map to here, which we map to here, which we map to here, which we map to here. Okay? And then here you can continue to do this partition. So here, if you look, because this is just a fixed point, so if you look at all the pre-images, now you do exactly the same as we did in the other case, right? Now you just need to worry about filling in this, and you just fill it by looking at all the sequence of pre-images of all the endpoints. And you get here, so if we zoom into here, right, what we get, this is minus 2. Right? And we just get a sequence of partition elements accumulating to minus two, to, sorry, to two, okay? Such that each one maps to the next one. Okay, so here you get this one maps to this one, which maps to delta, and then here you get a smaller one that maps to this one, that maps to this one, maps to delta, and so on, and you get an infinite countable sequence of partition elements, right? And then all you need to do is pull back this partition that you construct here, and you look here, 
this gives you, because this interval here maps to that, so this gives you a countable sequence of partition elements here, and then you look at the pre images and you get a countable, two countable sequences, one from the left and from the right, accumulating on Z. Okay? So you end up with this partition accumulating on zero, here accumulating on zero. Here it will always look like this, and here it will always look like this. Okay? So topologically, this gives a full branch map. We have shown it from the construction. Is this map good for us? Is it uniformly expanding? This is a little bit more tricky. So again, I will leave also this as an exercise, but I will tell you a little bit how, how to do this. So exercise f equals f tau from delta to delta is uniformly expanding. Okay, and then let me write also as optional, but this is uh, this is uh, non-trivial. Is to show that it has bounded distortion. Uh, let me not. Well, okay. In this case, this bounded distortion requires some fairly more advanced techniques, but it, it is true that it does. So, in some sense, both, what both of these have done is have been able to avoid the problematic point. Right? Notice also here, zero is no longer on the boundary of any of the partition elements of our new full branch map. Right? Zero is accumulated by partition elements, but it's not on the boundary of any single one of them. Okay? And why do you think, how do you think we can show that this is uniformly expanded? As an important exercise I'd like you to do. So, if for the initial pieces it's fairly simple, it's almost explicit, you know, you can literally, for these points, delta 2, delta 3, the derivative is basically fairly large, okay, you can more or less calculate it explicitly. Okay, the problem is when you come very close to zero. Okay, so what happens when you come very close to zero? As you saw, this when you when you look at an element very close to zero, then the derivative is the composition, is the product of the derivatives along the orbit, right by the chain rule. And the problem is you start at a big disadvantage because the first thing you do is you multiply by something extremely small. So what you'd like is the derivative to be bigger than one everywhere. Right? In fact, when these intervals are very small, you're mapping a very small interval to a very big interval with bounded distortion, so you expect the derivative to be very, the, the average derivative is very large, because by the mean value theorem, right, you are, there must be some point where the derivative is very large if you're mapping a very small interval to the whole thing. So with bounded distortion, you need to show the derivative everywhere is very large. You can't have one point where the derivative is very large, and one where the derivative is very small, you would not have bounded distortion. So, you really need to show that the derivative, when you're very close, by the time you come back, it has become very large. Right? And the problem is you start very small, very, very small, arbitrarily small. Right? When you come very, very close, you start with a number that can be as close as you want to zero, but then you multiply by lots of large numbers. So you need to show, because then after that, what happens? After that, where are you? So what's the derivative in the next it, next point. So this is x, has very small derivative. Where is f of x? f of x is very close to minus 2, which means it's very close to here. And what's the derivative here? Very large. Yeah, very large, relatively large. It's about 4, in fact, here. It's exactly 4 here, so it's very close to 4 here. Okay? So it's larger than 1, but of course it's not large enough to compensate the small derivative here, all in one go. 
okay? But then we have the next iterate. Where's the next iterate? If you're very close to minus 2, then the next iterate will be very close to 2. Right? This is how we, we build. The fact that you're very close to 0, remember the way we built it, means that here you come very close to 2. Okay? And the derivative here also is good. Okay? And then, remember the way it works is that if you're very close to 2, then you stay here for a very long time. Basically, you stay very close to 2. By the time you get here, then you're almost finished. Like by the time you get here, then the next step is here, and then the next step is delta, and you're done. Okay? So if you imagine that you are in the delta 1000, suppose you're in delta 1000. Delta 1000 is very, very small, close to the critical point. So you start with a very, very small derivative. Okay? And then you have a derivative 4, and then you have, or, or 3, 3 and a half, something close to 4. And then you also have a derivative close to 4, okay? And then you spend a very long time there. Basically, you spend almost a thousand iterates, because as I said, you know, you spend at least 997 iterates, because you have one iterate here, and then you only have two. Once you get to here, you just have two more iterates to get in. So you spend kind of 997 iterations very close to 2. And during all that time, you're accumulating a derivative of the order of 3 and a half, bigger than 3, to the power 997. Okay? So the exercise, but I, I really would like you to try to do it, so I'm not going to tell you more, is exactly that. So you need to show that 3 and a half to the 997 is enough to compensate that small derivative there. Okay? So basically you need to choose a delta here because the derivative here, this is quadratic, so the derivative here is proportional to the distance. So you know with a certain point, depending on the distance here, exactly what the derivative is there. Right? And depending on this distance, you also know how close to 2 you come. So you can calculate the distance here, and from that distance you can calculate exactly how many iterates you need before you get here. Okay? So that's how you need to relate the number of iterations that you have to compensate this with the value of the derivative. It's a very nice and subtle exercise. Okay? But it works. The amazing thing, it works. Okay, it's really quite amazing. So the amazing thing is that even though you have points with arbitrarily small derivatives, you spend enough time near 2 to compensate for that. And so the accumulation of those is, is all uniformly large, and you get this uniformly expanding full branch map. Okay, so um, now, as I promised, I'd like to show you what we do. So in this case, also, this induced map, its full branch has got bounded distortion. It therefore has an absolutely continuous invariant measure, right? So we've taken a subset of the space. We've defined the first little map to this subspace. And there is a measure, probability measure, sitting on minus 1, 1 which is invariant, ergodic, but not for the original map, but for this induced map. Okay? And we'd like to use this now to construct an invariant, ergodic, absolutely continuous probability measure for the original map. Okay? So I'll do that, but maybe this is a good time just to take a two-minute break before we do that. Okay. So now that we've seen these two non-trivial concrete cases, I think it's easier to work in a more general um, abstract setting. Okay, so we go back to our... To, uh, our abstract framework, we have this, okay, we have delta, and we have an induced map f, which is equal to f tau, from delta to delta. Okay, so we have a map from delta to so there's a general construction that does not need necessarily to know anything about this map, but in general, if you have a measure 
So let me hat your probability measure. Let me, uh, sorry, I want to make this bigger picture. So what? So I'm going to describe a general formula to take this measure and spread it out on our space using the dynamics. Any measure, okay? And then we'll see in the special case in which mu hat is our invariant ergodic measure, but for the moment it's just any measure, but we have this induced map. So the fact that we have this induced map means that we have a partition of that, right? Whatever, even if this is not a full branch map, whatever, just by definition, we have a partition, we can define delta n is equal to the set of x in delta, such that tau x equals n. Okay, this is whatever tau we choose, even if tau is not the first return time, we fix a tau, so we fix the choice of return time, so for each point, or almost every point, we fix some time when it comes back, and this gives us uh, some, some um, partition, delta 2, delta 3, okay, delta n of our space. Okay, there's this part. So, <clears throat> what is the property of this partition? Well, we look at this partition delta n. And what does it do? Well, we have here, we have f of delta n. And then we have f2 of delta n. And then so on. Right? until we have f n minus 1 of delta n and then where's f n of delta n? f n of delta n is in here okay by choice because we know that by definition all these points they go back inside delta okay so at the moment we do not worry how they go back in in the cases we, we've looked at the, this delta n maps nicely bijectively diffeomorphically to delta but for the moment it doesn't matter we come back. Okay, so there is a very natural way to spread out the measure. Okay, and this is the following: we have our measure mu hat on delta n. Okay, on sorry on delta, and then we can look at the measure mu hat of this delta n. Right, and then we can take this measure and spread it on here. We are want to define a measure on the whole space, and I can say well, if you take a subset of the, in the space and if it intersects here, then I, I take this measure and I, in some sense, push it forward to this and to this and to all these pre-images and I add measure to the whole space. So let me be more, let me be more formal here. So I'm going to define a measure known which is equal to the sum n equals 1 to infinity of the sum from i equals 0 to n minus 1 of f star i of the measure mu hat restricted to delta n. So we're going to think about a little bit what this formula is doing. Okay. This formula is spreading the measure in the way I described. Let's think about what this is. So notice that f i star of mu hat restricted to delta n of some set A is equal to, by definition, mu hat restricted to delta n of f minus i of A. Okay? And what does this mean? You have to think to that, that. It means that we look at F minus I of A and we just look at the part that, that falls into that then. So this is exactly by definition mu hat of F minus I of A intersection delta N. F 
And what does that mean? That means that if you look at, if your set A, suppose your set A is like this, this is our set A. Okay, because we're taking some set A in, in our space. Okay, and what I'm saying is that I know that here, if A intersects F of delta N, so this part here, where they intersect, then this means that F minus 1, this intersects F of delta N. So this means that the pre-image of A under F will, must intersect delta N. Right? Because if F delta N intersects A, then F minus 1 of A must intersect delta N. Okay? So I assign the F, if I want, for I equals 1, okay? For I equals 1, I assign a measure to this set A, F, so F star of mu hat delta 1, uh, sorry, uh, yes, delta N, delta N of the set A is equal to mu hat of F minus 1 of A intersection delta N. Okay, so this contribution, so this is a sum of a lot of measures, okay, but the contribution given by this particular value, which is for whatever N we fixed, I equals 1, okay, then this measure will be given by looking at this intersection, pulling back this intersection to here, and looking at the mu hat measure of these points, the ones that map into A. Yeah. Okay? And then maybe A might intersect lots of these, right? So it might intersect lots of these, okay? But the contribution of each one, here it intersects this, here it intersects this, is given by the different I's, right? So we fix N, for each N, you look N, Okay, so you fix n, and then you look here from i equals 0 to n minus 1, which means that you look, if the a might also, might also intersect here, that's the case i equals 0, in which, in which case you just take mu hat of delta n, okay, and otherwise you look at whether f delta n intersects a, if it does, you take the intersection, you pull it back, and you calculate the measure, and then you look at whether F2 delta N intersects A. If it does, you take the intersection, you pull it back, and you calculate the measure, and you do that for all the images of delta N up to time N minus 1. Right? That's exactly what this is doing. So this is exactly the same thing as taking the measure mu hat restricted to delta N and pushing it forward. In other words, you're looking at the image of delta N and you say, this set also has measure and this measure is given exactly by taking the mu hat measure and pushing it forward in that sense, that every subset here has a measure that is given by the measure of the pre-image of that set. Okay? So you're taking this measure and you're sp spreading it forward. And you do that for delta 1. And th so delta 1 are the points that just come back. And then delta 2 is the points you start here, and then you move forward, and then you come back. But you only look at this point and its image. Delta 3, you look at this region, its image, its second image, and that's it. And delta n, you look at its image up to n minus 1, and that's it. Okay. So, so this. Is that finite measure? No, not exactly. This is exactly the point. This is exactly the point that we're going to discuss. Okay? At the moment, we don't know that it's a finite measure. Because you're adding mass. Okay? We're not just defining the push forwards, we're adding all these contributions. So that's exactly a very good question. Okay? So what is this measure? How do we know it's, if it's finite or not? Okay? Let's see what the total measure is that we get. In other words, let's try to apply this measure to measure the measure of the whole space. Okay? So let's write Let's write nu of the whole space x and see what we get. Right? So nu is equal to the sum 
n equals 1 to infinity of the sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 over f i star mu hat is to the delta n of x of the whole space. So, um, okay, using this here, this is equal to the sum n equals 1 to infinity of the sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 of this, right? So of mu hat f minus i of x intersection delta n. Okay, but what's f minus i of x? f minus of x is just everything, it's just all of x. Okay, f minus 1 of x, f minus, of f, f minus i of x, it's, we've taken the whole space, okay, the image of the whole space is itself. So this is just like saying the sum n equals 1 to infinity of the sum i equals 0 to minus 1 of mu hat of delta n. So now we don't have i in this anymore, right? Each term is delta n. So this is just equal to the sum n equals 1 to infinity of n times the mu hat of delta n. Is this finite? What's the sum of mu hat of delta n? 1. One. And what's the sum of mu? of n times mu hat of delta n. It depends. It depends. Absolutely. It's like um, uh, in probability is a like moment of something. something. Yes. It's a moment of uh, this yes. region and, and the random variable is a moment of this uh, something. Yes. For example, if you consider mu delta n to be 1 over n squared, and normalize it up to a factor, then this diverges. Exactly. But if it's 1 over n cubed, then... Exactly. Very good observation. Exactly. So, it depends on how fast the measure of this goes to zero. Because it goes to zero, of course, because the sum is, is 1. Okay? But that's... A, let me write... In fact, let me write those two. Uh, Cases because I think that's very uh, it's very useful to keep in mind. So um, so this is not necessarily finite. Um, okay, so yeah. No, it's not necessarily finite. Okay. For example, if mu hat of delta n goes like, as you said, with some constant to normalize this one, goes like 1 over n squared, okay? Then this implies that the sum, the sum of n mu hat of delta n is of the order of the sum of 1 over n, okay, which is infinite. That's right. And whereas if mu hat of delta n is as long as it's something less than equal 1 over n cubed, Okay, then this implies that the sum of n mu hat delta n is less than something of the order of 1 over n squared, which is finite. So 
anything faster than one over n cubed. In fact, anything faster than one over n squared, because if you have some epsilon here, it will also sum up. Right? So as long as you have something that is less than n to the 2 plus epsilon, and then here you get n to the epsilon, then you get summability. So this is a kind of threshold cutoff point. Um, and this is the thing we, are, we still need to check in our cases. So, wait, so there's several remarks I need to make. Um, okay, so if, so, So let me write it like this. So if if nu of x is finite, uh, well, yes, if nu of x is finite, okay, then we can normalize. We can renormalize nu. We can let mu is equal to nu divided by nu of x is a probability measure. Okay, so we just normalize and we get a probability measure. Okay, and um, and so now exactly. So that's the lemma I'm going to write. But I think I will. Well, I don't know whether to prove it or to leave it as an exercise. So um, okay. So let me write this as a as a lemma. So to state the lemma, let me just mention a slightly different way to state this summability condition. Notice that mu hat delta is a function of delta, right? So mu hat, um, so what does this, so we have, think of it like this, we have, this is delta, right? And then we have this partition to that ends, right? And then we have, um, sorry, we have n is a function of delta n. So uh, here we have delta n. And let me define, so this, this sum can be seen as an integral, right, in a very simple way, because this sum is just the integral of the function n on delta, right? So on each delta n, so this is delta 1, and this is delta 2, and so on. And then we can define the function 1, 2, 3, and so on, n. And then on delta 1, you define the function 1. On delta 2, you define the function 2. On delta 3, you define the function 3, and so on. And on delta n, you define the function delta n. Okay? So you see that this n times mu hat of delta n is just the area under the graph of this function. Right, so we have a function that goes, it's a step function. Is that okay? So this is just the area, this is n for each piece delta n, you measure the mu hat of delta n, and you measure this. So this is actually equal to the integral of, uh, we can write it, the integral of tau, the mu hat, okay? Because tau is equal to n on delta n, the function tau, okay? So this is the function tau. So on delta 1, this function takes the value 1. On delta 2, the function takes the value 2, and so on, okay? So this sum 
is exactly the integral of the return time function from delta. Okay, so we had delta and we had defined the return time function tau and these delta n's are defined in terms of the return time function and so just because of the way the calculation works the uh, summability of this is exactly, the, the value that you get for this is exactly this integral so whether this is finite or not is exactly whether this integral is finite or not okay, because as we saw before the, depending on how this is going to zero and how this is increasing you get, integral, you get summability or not, which is the same thing as integrability of time. Okay? So the reason why I want to say that is because it's easier, it's generally, you just talk about integrability of the return time function. Okay? So when this is finite, another way to say it is just that the return time is integrable with respect to this measure that you've chosen. Of course, it depends on the measure, the integrability. Okay, so I will just write it like that. So suppose, um, so let f equals f tau delta to delta be an induced map with integrable return times. If mu hat is invariant for f, then uh, okay. So we have mu. If the integrability is the return time, we can define this. Okay, this is just equal to one over the integral of tau the mu hat times nu. Right, this is the normalizing factor, is this integral, which is exactly that sum. Right? Then nu is invariant for little f. Okay, two, if nu hat is ergodic for big f, for the induced map, then, uh, sorry, mu. Well, it's the same, it's, it works for both, but we. It, might as well just normalize mu is ergodic for little f and finally three if you have some reference measure so that if a mu hat is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue then mu is also absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue if we have a Lebesgue measure right in the setting in which we have some manifold that we have in the measure. Okay, so this is perfect. This gives us the invariant ergodic absolutely continuous measure in our examples, right? So if we can find... So what is missing in our examples? We showed that the induced map has an ergodic invariant absolutely continuous invariant measure, okay? That is the last final condition we need to show is this for those examples. Okay? I will not include the verification of this in the curriculum of the course. You can try to do that. But uh, the interesting thing, so uh, in, the, in the quadratic map, you actually get exponential decay of this. So it's easy to see that some of you get that these the, the uh, the measures of these are going exponentially fast, so this is easily converging, so this is easily integrable. But it's an interesting thing that in the in the uh, in the intermittency map, this is sometimes called the intermittency map, the one we look at. So in the intermittency map, then we get integrability. So the integral of tau t mu hat is, is finite if and only if 
alpha is between 1 and 2. So, this is the picture. Okay. Um, I will think about whether to do this and do this calculation in detail. It's an interesting, but it's very, it's just calculations really. But uh, there's a very interesting situation that if when we've constructed a map on here, right? So this is delta. Remember the construction depends on alpha, but the, I mean the 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 the, the position of the points depends on alpha, but the construction is the same for every alpha, right? So we have this partition like this. Right? And what we're doing here is we just have an absolutely, we will construct the induced map with an absolutely continuous invariant measure. In fact, if you remember from our, from our um, uh, theorem, this measure has density, Lipschitz continuous density above, bounded above and below. So you can think of it almost as Lebesgue measure. Okay? And then when you push forward according to the formula, all you're doing is taking this Lebesgue measure, this measure which is almost Lebesgue, and pushing it forward to all these pieces, right, and summing them all up. And you're asking if the sum of all these pieces is finite or not. The sum of the Lebesgue measures of all these pieces, basically. Multi uh, calculated several times, right? because of course the sum of all these pieces just once is equal to 1. Okay? But here, when you take each of these, so for this piece here, you're summing this, plus this, plus this, plus this, plus this, plus this, uh, a certain number of times, right, n times. And then when you take this, you're summing again, you sorry, sorry, this goes here, and then it goes back and here. And then when you take this, you, you, you're mapping this to here, and then you're summing all of these, right? So this one gets summed lots of times, each of these elements, you have to add the sum of this many times, okay? And uh, it turns out that if alpha is greater than or equal to 2, then um, this diverges the sum and you get an infinite measure instead of a probability measure. And uh, in some sense what happens is you can see the second derivative, I'll just take one more minute to to say this comment because it's very interesting that first derivative is 1 plus, plus alpha x to the alpha minus 1 and the second derivative is um, alpha times alpha minus 1 times x to the alpha minus 2 the second derivative and what happens when alpha is bigger than 2 so when alpha is between 1 when alpha is between 1 and 2 then the second derivative is goes to infinity as x goes to 0 okay what is the so the problem here is always in this in this uh, this region here and and it's all about how fast so let me zoom into that. Okay. This is the this is the diagonal. Okay. This is the So when you have a points here, you take a point here and you see that it moves to the right because it's above the diagonal. Okay? But how much to the right does it move? Depends okay. on it depends on the first derivative and also on the sec. Well, yes, it depends on x alpha. That's right. And it turns out that, uh, uh, in some sense, the value of alpha tells you how fast these points are moving away, which is what gives you the integral. Which is what, in, in the end, gives you the integrability or not. In the sense that, when alpha is between one and two then the second derivative goes to infinity, which means that the first derivative is moving very fast away from 1. Right? So the derivative here is 1. The derivative nearby is bigger than 1. But how much bigger? 
Okay, so the fact that the second unit is infinite here, it means in some sense that the, it's a very subtle and very little, right? But it is moving away from one sufficiently fast so that points, when they move away, they move away in some sense with some sufficient speed. If the alpha is bigger than two, right? Then the second derivative is zero, okay? Which means the second derivative is very small, which means the first derivative is, it means the order of tangency is larger, right? And this turns out that means it's very sticky. So the points are spending much longer in here, okay? And if you look at the infinite measure that you get when you do the calculation, the infinite measure is only, measure, is only infinite in the neighborhood of zero. So when you do, we get the absolutely continuous invariant probability measure for delta, then we spread it out on the whole space according to the formula that we got, okay? When r plus bigger than two, we get an infinite measure. And if you look at where this infinite measure is living, you see that it's actually only infinite in the neighborhood of zero. So everywhere else this measure is finite, but it is accumulating here. And that's because the points are getting stuck here and they're spending a lot of time. Okay, this is just a little heuristic approach, but I do not, at the moment, I, not, I don't think we're going to, I don't think I'm going to do the calculations for this, okay? I just wanted to give you some feeling for that. Okay, so I think we will call it again. Thank you.